trust me, it gets screwed up every way. No, I believe it. It's but the thing is, it's always the simple names. Um, Boys, half hill. All right, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, welcome back into the Buster Show podcast. Today, we have a very special guest and a friend of mine, Matt Half Hill. Welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm so excited about this. I, I want to just keep sort of our, our offline conversation going to start this off, which was around Clubhouse. Um, yes. When this podcast goes out, um, you know, it, it'll be it'll be about a few days after we're recording this, and Clubhouse is currently the hottest underground app. Um, and you were talking about. Um, you know, all of the ways that you yeah. could see it being utilized sort of for the, for the fitness space um, and everything of that nature. First of all, what, what has your experience been so far on that app? I mean, I, so I got an invite to it um, uh, from Bima Williams, um, who is, does claim the stories. And I, so I got, I got looped and I had heard about it and then I got the invite. So I'm like, okay, let me go check it out. And I jumped in and I was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. Like, this is like democratizing, you know, the live talk show for, for radio. Um, you know, people have been so big into podcasts, but this is actually like the interactive podcast that happens in real time. Um, so I think that like, this is ripe for disruption in a lot of things. Um, I already think of like, you know, I always enjoyed talk radio before, especially where it was a live show and people could call in and have dialogue with the host. And this is like that, you know, except anybody can access and um, yeah, and a whole range of topics and interests. It's so, it's so fascinating. I'm so curious to see if it lasts, you know, long term to where people when people are going out again and, you know, life is a little bit more back to normal and or if like the fun sort of wears off as the floodgates open because it's not even open to Android users yet, let alone the fact that it's invite only. Yeah, I think I think that one thing that's going to that this, the platform is going to need, and I think like you're going to see with different rooms, there needs to be some better structure. I think there needs to be a better control and maybe a little bit more framework, which Look, I mean, everything iterates, you know, when, when tw like the way Twitter is used today is not the way people were using Twitter in 2007. Uh, same thing with Instagram and, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the beast will force its evolution and that beast being the, the mass public. But I think that the better structure, the better the, the, the rooms actually uh, um, operate. A hundred percent. So I want to dive a little bit into your background to start this off. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, you started Nice Kicks, which is, you know, one of the biggest um, social media outlets around sneakers and, and so many other things. But where did you um, where did you first uh, start to dabble into social and uh, what, what's sort of your origin story? So my well, dabbling into social happened after dabbling into sneakers and the Internet. But dabbling into social started with MySpace in 2005 or six. Um, and actually, like, that was something that we had done when we launched the blog, we had been integrating social from the get go. Um, the way that I saw social was that it was a way that I could take the conversation that was happening on the blog outside of the blog. So, you know, we had a comment section, which was the first of like, a, you know, when Nice Cakes launched, it was the first blog that was just about sneakers, like WordPress blog about sneakers. And we had a comment section, which was, I thought, a very, you know, at the time they called it like Web 2.0, the idea that you could go to a website and interact with it. Um, you can, you know, if you weren't just digesting content, you were also putting content yourself there by leaving a comment, people could reply to it and all that kind of stuff. But I found social was a great tool where you could take the conversation outside of even your website. And so it started with MySpace. And of course, like as soon as Twitter came about, we were on there. Um, I heard of Facebook because my brother had a .edu email. I dropped out of college so before I could even get a .edu email. So like I wasn't even able to get on Facebook uh, for a long time, not until like 29, 2009 or 2010. Um, but yeah, so we, we used it early on. Um, and we were always like, whenever there was a new platform, I'd immediately jump on it just to see how could I use this? Could Is this something that would be potentially successful for us or you know how could we like you know use it for nice kicks and one of those was instagram um and we joined like in january of 2011 
Like we were wow. the first, we were the first account. Like we were on there before Nike. We were on there before like everybody else. I actually found it by mistake. Um, I was wanting to reinstall Hipstamatic, which was like a app that could take like old school looking photos. And this was a suggested app, um, Instagram. And I was like, okay, let me install this. It's free. Okay. Hipstamatic actually charged you money. And at first I loved it because oh, it would process the photos faster, but then I dove into it more and I was like, oh my gosh, this is a social stream. This is not just a photo taking app. And I was like, well, this could be great because we already started seeing that Twitter people wanted to involve photos more and more in their tweets, like linking out. I'm like, oh wait, so this is like Twitter, but with photos. Oh, this is going to be big. So yeah. That was the start of so, Instagram it's so for us. It's crazy to think about now Instagram being a photo taking app or anything oh my gosh. that isn't what it is now. That's all people know. Nobody, I don't even have a frame of reference to time before Instagram. Uh, and so that's, and you know what's funny? You mentioned that. I can't tell you how many times I've met like younger people like yourself and they'll say, wow, I can't believe you're the guy who started the Nice Cakes Instagram. I'm like, Damn. Yeah, I guess I, that is true. But it's like, you know, there was so much, so many years before that. But, you know, a lot of people don't even remember what the internet was before social media or especially the internet pre iPhone. Totally. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. I remember when uh, I'm actually going to make a post about this later. But when when you were talking to somebody online, like on Facebook, you would say goodbye. You'd say oh, yeah, goodbye. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> When you're talking to when you're texting with somebody, it was like it was like the conversation ended. Nobody has said goodbye to me via text in I don't know ten years. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It's That's, just so yeah, crazy. It's very good observation. Yeah, I mean, I guess the thing was is at the time you didn't know whether or not the person would be at their computer, but ever, since now everybody's dialed into the matrix and connected through a device in their pocket, like you're always plugged in right well now your computer goes with you <laughs> yes exactly. exactly so the nice kicks domain it was just a, the the handle on instagram it was it was just available at the time oh yeah i mean nice kicks handle was available on instagram I mean, we bought the domain many many years ago i've been operating on that but um in 2011 i mean at nike was available i mean like all these names were available um you know because the, i mean nobody had land grabbed or anything like that and then nobody knew like we got on the popular page with 25 likes on a photo sometimes like if i started getting like i remember i saw like one post get like eight likes within a couple minutes and i remember hitting the group text of everybody on my team who i made them all sign up for instagram i was like everybody go like this photo i want to get this on the popular page and we got on the popular page with 25 likes um that's <laughs> not the way it works today but you know back then that's so crazy. Yeah, 100,000 likes might not even get you there now. Oh, to explore? No. It's, it's, it's really, it really changed. It's really changed. That's so crazy. They called it the popular page back then? It was called the popular page, yes. That's it's called so... the popular page. It was their version of the trending topics, you might say. <sighs> That's so funny. Um, so it in the, you know, so you, you started doing this on Instagram in 2011, I guess. Um, and you were obviously doing, you know, a lot before then. But what's, what's been your, uh, you know, biggest, um, the thing you're happiest about in having built in that sort of time in between? And A, and, and B, sort of some of those lessons that you've learned in the meantime that you would go uh, and implement on the front end. Um, I mean, boy, that's a, that's hard to pick one thing. Like there's been so much that's happened in the past nine years. Oh my gosh. Almost 10 years. Gosh, January of 2021 is 10 years from 2011. Jeez. Um, I would say that the past year has been by far the, I, I'm just beyond blown away with what my team's done. We pivoted our direction with Instagram It's right when the pandemic started. Um, I made some big changes with our team, um, and they really, they really worked. I gave, you know, like completely changed really what, what social was going to represent for us and our approach to all different social channels, um, specifically Instagram, you know, before in, nice kicks, Instagram was very product focused. 
you know, we were talking specifically about product and shoes. It's become and pivoted much more into kind of the lifestyle conversation of those who are into shoes. Um, you know, our product incorporated. Yeah, absolutely. But that's just part of it. But if you are into sneakers, you care much more than just the shoe than about the shoe itself. There's a whole lot of stuff, a whole lot of life happening around you that influences your love of shoes. And there's also a lot of ways that shoes influence the life around you. And I think that what we, what my team has done a really good job of is representing that, um, with their coverage on, on Instagram. Um, making use of all the different tools that Instagram has. I mean, from stories to live, to feed, to reels, you know, that part has really been the best thing that I think we've done. And that's all come in this year during the pandemic. That's awesome. So Matt, uh, the entrepreneur is, is one thing, but Matt, the fitness animal is totally, (laughs) is a totally different beast. We'll, we'll get back to, to Matt the Entrepreneur later, but I want to sort of talk about your, uh, like the moment that you decided you wanted to like completely flip the switch and, and sort of if you could give a little bit of context to what that means. Yeah, so I mean, it started three years ago or about three and a half years ago. It was like May of 2017. Um, and that was when I weighed 320 pounds. And I really was just not in a good place in my life at all. And I remember somebody had said something about like, you know, that me weighing 320 and I was like, no fucking way I weigh 320. I mean, when you get to a certain point, you stop going on the scale. You just like, I don't want to see this. Um, And I remember getting on the scale saying 319.8. I'm like, motherfucker, I am 320 pounds. Um, But the, it was at that point that I knew I just wanted to make a change. Like I was not happy with where I was. I knew where I was headed. I already started feeling pre-diabetic nerve damage like in my legs and like I knew where things like permanent damage was on the horizon for me um so that's when I started and you know it was it's been quite the journey I dropped like 100 some pounds like in the first like 15 months or something like that and uh but lately yeah then lately um I started something in on November 2nd which was 60 days before new year Um, and I have really been on a tear with that and really, I mean, I posted it to my Instagram and, and my first post on Facebook and I don't know how long, um, and showed the before and after photos of what I was able to do in 60 days. And it was just, and it wasn't just like the diet and fitness part of it. It was all other things like not like limiting screen time, not using my phone an hour before I go to sleep, reading at least 30 minutes a day. Um, other household rules, like in terms of just like cleaning procedure, everything like that. I just did a complete change again in my life and um, committed to it. And I, it's it, what the reason where I feel like it's, it's important to bring up is that it also has really benefited Matt the Entrepreneur because Matt the Entrepreneur has never had such a clear head. I've never had such focus. I mean, my brother said it to me. He's like, this is the, this is the grade 12 mat. I remember this is the, you know, uh, this is the valedictorian mat that I, I remember, you know, you're, you're much more, you're much sharper, much more focused. Um, and that comes along with the fitness. Like it really is like, if you don't have a healthy body, you're not going to have a healthy mind. And the, um, I'm curious too, if you sort of saw some of like, you know, I, I haven't done the full, I've never gone like um, uh, cold turkey to hot turkey, like or, or vice versa, like that for everything, not just fitness. Mm-hmm. But discipline always creates more discipline. It's like this weird, oh, without com- question. It's like this weird yeah. compounding form that you can't describe because it's like if you if you're lazy um, about anything, right? Like if you don't feel like doing your work or your homework or whatever it is for anybody that's listening, if you go out and do something that's way harder than your homework, like go on a five mile run or, you know, lift a bunch of heavy weights, you're going to come back and be like, this is easy, you know? Yes, absolutely. And getting those, those wins, like no matter how small they are, they, they help, they like build your confidence each day into getting more things done. Like one of the things on my list was like making my bed every morning. Like it just seems like such a small thing. Right. But I did that process and I'm like, you know, you get, as soon as you wake up, you have your first win of the day. It's just, it gets you into rhythm with everything. 
Um, and yeah, so it, it really does, it really does compound and continue to build up. Um, and it, it really is worth the investment for sure. Now, how, how important uh, has diet been on this journey? Oh, um, diet's the most important part. Really? You, you, can go, you can go run a marathon a day. Well, maybe not to this extreme, but you, you can exercise a ton. If you don't have your diet right, you're not going to get fit. Also, too, you're going to have to, I tell everybody this, you have to get your relationship with food right before you get the relationship with your body right and your fitness. Because part of, of developing as an athlete is you have to fuel your body the right way. If you don't have the right relationship with food, you won't treat it as fuel. You will treat it as the way we have treated it before. I mean, right now, like food is straight up my bitch. Like you serve a purpose for me. You don't bring me pleasure. You give me protein. You give me fats. You give me energy through carbohydrates. But I use you, not the other way around. And before my relationship with food is it was something that I use as a way to deal with my problems. Or, you know, I was hooked on, I don't know, the sugars, the salts, the fats, the oils, the processed nature of the food. So it wasn't like I wasn't using it as that, you know, I was maybe like an addict of it. Um, but once you, you know, like diet is I, 100% the most important part of it. Because sugar is addictive like anything else. Sugar, I mean, that's, so that was one of the things I did in this time, like no added sugars at all, no alcohol of any kind, no liquid, um, you know, calories, you know, like just water, you know, black uh, coffee, black tea, like that's a very important part for me. Yeah, honestly, you know, I, I can't even legally drink, but I'm with you on that one. I think it, <laughs> it's super, it's super important. I mean, it's just, it's just a lot of a lot of sugar. The thing is, it's everywhere you look. It's in every store. Oh my gosh, and it's everywhere. It's in every commercial. It's when you watch a YouTube video, it's in the YouTube video. Like you cannot. So it, you have to have, like, it, it sounds funny, like hearing you describe it as like this intense relationship where it's your bitch. But if it's not, there's like, it's not, there's nothing in, there's no in between. It doesn't yeah, you exist. Yeah, for me, like food is, it's not, it's not something I take pleasure in. Like it is, it fuels my pleasure. It fuels me with, with what I need out of life. And the, the difficult thing too, which is, you know, why, one of the reasons why I spend so much time like alone and I'm traveling the country doing like month to month in different cities is because if I'm with other people, I can't force somebody oh, else to be as extreme as I am. So if I'm with agreed. my family, right, or I'm with a friend, I can't, I would never tell somebody else what to do. I want, I will always encourage my friends that I really love to be the best that they can be, but I can never and explain why and explain the benefits and da 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 da. If they don't want to do it, that's okay. I don't, you know, every, everybody can decide for themselves. But it does become a problem when there is candy laying out open <laughs> on the counter when I walk in late at night and I'm hungry. Yep. Yep. No matter Absolutely. how long you are at this extreme, like you, you and I both are for, for food and, and fitness and whatnot, it's still going to get you if it's laying there open. Yep. <laughs> exactly. So you got to, you, you, the best advice, you know, I've definitely, I, I would tell myself is to put yourself in positions where people won't stop you from succeeding. It's very much like, I mean, it's not to trivialize or downplay either one, but it's very similar. Like when you're doing this, you have to approach it similar to the way somebody who has a problem with alcohol would. Like you remove yourself from situations or you make sure you're, you you know, are on alert. If you're going into a situation, what might be there, what might be in front of you might, you know, like you have to just think about that kind of stuff. And um, one of the things I learned was what are foods that I can eat no matter where I am that I can find that are healthy alternatives. And for me, like early on, I mean, I forced myself, it took like two or three weeks to actually start enjoying baby carrots. But I'm like, no matter where I am in the country, you can find baby carrots in like the crappiest grocery store or corner store or 7-Eleven. You can find those darn things, truck stops even. 
And it was like, this is that one thing where if I get into like a food desert type of thing, I do have a rescue. But yeah. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, it's 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 so true. You you just got to pick new favorites, right? Yep, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, in, in terms of working out, though, where where have you sort of what have you enjoyed the most? What has been the most difficult? Um, and what would your best advice be to somebody who's just making that flip? Not, not, we'll, we'll get back to the diet for, for the next question, but just on the actually working outside. So in the beginning I had, I didn't really have many options. Um, I had to diet down about 30 or 40 pounds before I could even do any kind of exercise. And that's because when you weigh 320 pounds, any type of like motion and movement, you're putting extreme, you're putting your knees and other ligaments at extreme risk. Um, I had to like literally crawl, walk, run. I started out on the treadmill, just walking. And it was like, you know, 15 minutes at a time, maybe 20 minutes at a time. at I don't know, like three or three and a half mile an hour pace. Can't remember where I started exactly. Um, but it was just slowly but surely adding a little bit more time, maybe adding a little bit more speed. Oh, here's like a 30 second jog I'm going to do for a little bit and then increase that to a minute, increase that to two minutes and go flip between like walking and jogging. Um, I'm at the point now like where my workouts are weight training and then uh, swimming. Um, but like, you know, when you start out, like you have to, you have to start slow and, and, and gradually build up and incorporate other movements and motions, but always start small and grow up from there and never overexert yourself. Like something that I really had adopted early on was the idea of consistency rather than trying to get the most out of a workout, you know, like, because I had in 2016, I had tried to go really hard in the gym. And of course, just like a lot of people who are not in shape and you go too hard, it goes until it breaks, and, you know, you injure yourself. And now you're missing out on weeks of working out because you're nursing an injury. My goal was how many calories can I burn per week per month, not per time at the gym. And the way that you get the most out of per week per month is you get on the board every damn day. And when you start getting on the board every day, your body starts to get trained that you're going to be working out every single day. And your body starts to change itself to adapt to that. So it's the idea of having consistent motion. You're, you're speaking my language. I started this thing called no days off seas. And it's so funny because everybody told me when I did that, they're like, you're going to kill yourself working out every day. No. Like, it's not, it's not like that. You don't, you no. don't, you'll kill yourself if you go too far every day but i literally mean like instead of taking a day off run three miles walk three miles uh lift a couple weights do a bunch of push-ups do a bunch of sit-ups yep. on your off day yep like instead of instead of eating like a ton of bad food do all those positive things and eat healthy that's your off right. day Exactly. And then go back and repeat. Like mix up your workouts. Don't lift two hundred pound weights every day. Yes, that'll destroy your arm. Yeah, and you leg. can't. Yeah, you can't train your the same things every day. But you can definitely have something. A hundred percent. And that's 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 where that stems from. So I love hearing you say that. Um, now, in, in terms of the diet again, what uh, what have you? What, what particular things do you see the mo or what would your best advice be for somebody who's really um, just starting to, to take that turn on the diet front? Would it be to like self isolate and things like that um, to be able to lock in and focus or, or what, if you had to start that over again, what would your process be? So it helped being single from that standpoint because I didn't have any external forces or influences that I had to fight or compromise with. But I would say that if you have, if you are in a partnership or, you know, you are with others, it's really good to declare what your intentions are and what you're doing and ask for their support with it. But just like, let them put them on notice. Like, this is what I'm wanting to do. Declaration is extremely important. Not only is declaration important to yourself, but it's, you kind of also create like this little layer of accountability when you involve others. So something that I did was I declared to, you know, myself and I, I even had a conversation with my parents who were like a thousand miles away in Denver at the time, like what I was doing in terms of uh, eating a primarily, you know, vegetable based, like plant-based diet. Um, 
And part of it was actually talking through, not looking for validation, but just actually addressing it. So I under, you know, stand it to myself better, but that declaration is extremely important. And it, it also helps if there's somebody that, you know, who doesn't just love you unconditionally, who knows what you're doing, because they'll call you out on your bullshit too. You know, like get, get that friend who knows what you're doing. And, um, that's important. You know, like when I started that project for the 60 days, like it was maybe two weeks in that I realized, you know, that these, where where the days would fall and because i started the plan not knowing where that 60 days is going to land on january 1st but i i think when i figured it out i had a um a picture like 14 or 17 17 days in i texted that over to my brother to show him the progress i was making and i'm like january 1st i'm going live with what i'm doing well when i declared that i was going to do that in six weeks like you better believe i stayed even more focused on my progress I stayed even more focused on the plan. I mean, and like, I just didn't, I didn't send that to just my brother. I sent it to several other friends. Like as I was getting the updates, like I was saying, look, this is what I've been up to. You haven't heard from me. I'm going live January 1st. And there's that bit of like accountability you build for yourself with it. that I think really, really helps you stick to your plan. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not a bad thing to incorporate others into it. You know, like what do they say? Like a town, does, like it takes a village to raise a child. Like, Part of making a change in yourself, you can't just do it by yourself. Like it does, you, you know, I mean, you, I guess in theory you could, but it does help. It is a cheat code that other people know you're involved on it. So. A hundred percent. You know, for me starting, I, I would always tell people at the beginning, I, you know, it was a l- little bit before the pandemic, but I would tell you like, I don't eat bread and sugar. So if you see me eating it, you're like if you if you see us at a plate i would say that for a couple yeah. of reasons one so that they knew what restaurants to pick for us to eat at if we were going out to eat um and two just like that social accountability and therefore i never did it i wasn't going to be proving i wasn't going to be proven wrong i wasn't going to be wrong um and i, I think even just yeah. posting those things out like to the world like posting on your facebook or twitter or instagram or whatever um just so that all your friends literally everybody can see that you're serious about this the problem then becomes if you don't do it like i i do know people who are like yeah i'm gonna start this diet and then i see the same post a week later yeah i'm starting this diet and then i see the same post a week later and then it starts monday yeah and then it it, it's just devaluing your word um so that's dangerous but not not just to the public but to yourself i mean Um, if you're making that choice to devalue yourself that's your choice that's on you but I, I hear what you're saying. I so I one of the things that I think helped me. I, I did use social media in a way to to help me with this. In April or so of 2018, it's April 1st of 2018. I went for my first run, and it was 100 days in running is what I what the plan was. So I ran every single day, and it's like right when I started. Like I I guess I ran a 5K like you know a month earlier, um, and I declare that I was doing a hundred days in running and every day I would show on my, on my stories, me throwing my shoes or dropping my shoes of what I used to run that day. And people like, it was always cool because like a lot of people like got behind and were encouraging me as I was doing this, like, Oh my gosh, you're, you know, you're really going after it. You're not quitting. Like, Oh, you know, it was early on, like maybe two or three weeks in people were like, wow, I'm motivated by you. Like you are really sticking with this. Um, and I also got the Apple Watch, which I think is incredible because you can have your friends you've, involved you've in this it. conversation. They see your milestones or they see your workouts and you get praises from people. The Apple Watch. Yeah. I think, I think we, we had this conversation the first time we spoke, but it. Sorry, yeah. just. I'll see that for a sec. You're good. Yeah. No, it, it gamifies working out in a way. Yeah. 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 Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Um, I was just saying that it ga- the Apple Watch gamifies working out in a way that nothing else does. 100%. Like, I have a Whoop band, which I like, but I think the Apple Watch gives you more. I've never done anything except for the Apple Watch. And lately, honestly, for the last month, I haven't even worn my Apple Watch um, because I'll go, like, in, like, I mean, I'll just start playing like number games. So like in November, I 
did whatever, like 2000 calories a day burned working out, which was like four to five hours of working out a day, which is kind of insane. Yeah. But then I like, it got to a point where like at the end of November, I was like, oh, now I have to do 100,000 in December. <laughs> no, 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 I can't. I'm not doing that. I took yeah, it off. yeah, too much. I was just yeah. doing, I was doing it till I was burnt out at the end of the day. Um, but uh, yeah, those, those, the Apple Watch can take you to some extremes, which is a great thing for those, for anybody just getting started, because whatever that yeah. extreme is, if that's 500, 1,000 weights, runs, whatever, it'll get you there because you yeah, don't want, sure. you don't want to go to sleep with that ring not filled. Oh my gosh, you got to get all those rings filled. I, oh man, it's, it's unfortunate how many times I was racing over to the gym at 11 p.m. just so I could get that ring filled, you know, before the midnight hour. I know. <laughs> yeah, and then the new day begins. You, you know what my yeah. favorite thing was? Go work out at 11, leave at 1. So you got the day, the next oh my day, gosh. you got some like bonus points for the next day. <laughs> That, that, you know, that ironically sounds too much like what my family did with the buffets in, in Las Vegas when you go right before breakfast ends and then if you hang out for a bit, lunch is about to be served. But this is the healthier version of that. Oh my God, that. that's, a, that's a savage <laughs> move though. That's a savage that is, yeah. move. I kind of love it. Yep. <laughs> if you're going to do it, you might as well do it smart. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, that's, that's amazing. But yeah, that, that social accountability is really underrated. Um, it's something that, I mean, I, I guess I've done by default, but it's not something that I ever consciously did, but I've seen friends who have done it very consciously. Um, and it's done wonders because it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, what, what happens then is it becomes a conversation point, right? Anything that oh, you're yeah. passionate about, you have to talk about constantly or else you'll either lose passion for that or you won't stay disciplined in that. If I mm -hmm. tell you that, um, if I, I, if I want to become a professional skydiver tomorrow, right. And I tell you on this podcast that I'm gonna, like, I'm working on becoming a professional skydiver. Next time we talk, you're going to ask me how it's going. Everybody else is going to ask me how it's going and it's going to force me. Uh, it's, it's a going to put positive pressure, which is great. I think positive pressure is a very, very good thing. Um, but B it's going to make me, you know, think and, and, talk about it more and the same for everything that you did right um and the same for any company or anything like that so that that social accountability is really applicable to everything absolutely especially like in business and and other projects that you're doing you know for as an entrepreneur i think that they're you know it, if we look at it objectively that is you know something that it really helps us when we do talk with our you know the people we trust about what business projects we're working on they're going to check in on that like hey how are you doing on this how are how is this going how is that project uh, running for you um so we do it uh, as entrepreneurs all the time without even necessarily thinking about it but if you apply a lot of what you do as an entrepreneur to you know fitness and health like you will you will find it, it it'll work just like it does for your business why do you think more entrepreneurs aren't like super freak athletes and fit obsessed because i feel like those obsessions would carry over to one another but it's not the case usually no i mean i can definitely point back to pictures of of, of me where i was so focused on the business and not focused on anything else i mean it really comes down to like what you place as your as your values i mean right now like health fitness is it's my top priority like it's just my number one value um, and, and like it, it comes in, in front of business, honestly, for me at this point, that's not the way it was before, before it was like business was like first through 10th, you know, and then, and then maybe something else at, at 11th place. Um, but I think that, I think that we, it's, especially when we're young, it's, it's very easy to say, oh, I don't, I'm not going to go to the gym. I'm going to go crank out this extra thing. Oh, I'm not going to go to the gym right now. I'll do that later. I'll crank out and crank this out instead. Um, it's very easy when, especially when it is like a business where we get, we see that gratification and rewards that we want to keep getting more of the, that gratification and rewards. Other thing too, is that a lot of people in business, like we get in over our heads and we are, you know, as an entrepreneur, like you're wearing a ton of different hats, right? So you are the accountant, you're the janitor, you're the CEO, the CFO, uh, the tech, technical support, customer service representative and sales guy. Well, there are a lot of tasks and if you don't properly manage your time, it's very easy to get sucked in and spend your entire day doing a lot of, you know, 
a lot of um, business related tasks. But if you set high, you know, your if you set your priorities right, you will fill up your day with the top priority actions and remove the low level distractions. And the business can provide any business can provide a ton of low level distractions. Um, but yeah. yeah, I think taking a real account of your like, uh, <clears throat> you know, it, it's incredible nowadays how much data we have in our lives, right? You go to screen time yes. and you can see how much time you're spending on each individual app. If you're spending two hours a day on YouTube, you can cut that in half and spend an hour in the gym and or spend both of the hours on the treadmill watching YouTube. <laughs> exactly. It, that, that is one thing that I think screen time is, is, I really love what screen time has done. I know that probably Facebook Inc. is not the biggest fan of screen time, but what I think Apple did with this, when Apple created, when they had the screen time monitoring, they allowed the kind of like, I think that Apple was treading into potentially dangerous territory where it would have been likely for society to say, you got to take away the devices. You're spending too much time on these devices. These devices are addictive. You're spending too much time with your Apple products. By screen time, it now actually put the onus on us as users to say, well, where are we spending our time on our devices? What are we doing on the devices? And then you start to see, oh, it's not the device that's the issue. Maybe it's specific apps that maybe we're sucked into. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's me. Um, and being able to set limits on each app. Um, I mean, I, I, love net, I love metrics. I love numbers. And I think that's you know, a really helpful tool in analyzing what you're doing. No, it's so funny too. I can tell that, you know, health and, and fitness is your top priority as well, just because of how much more passion you have talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, trust me, I am very passionate about nice gigs. Um, we've, you know, th this year we, has been an incredible year for us. Um, our team has doubled in size. Uh, you know, we, it was a couple of weeks in the pandemic that we saw that some of our competitors in the space shed 25 and 33% of their workforce to competitors, I'm thinking of intent in particular. You know, we doubled our headcount during the pandemic. Um, you know, and cost structure wise, like we are still like, you know, only up 20% in our, in our monthly costs from a year ago. We, we did some restructuring right at the start of the year before the pandemic happened. Um, but, you know, we, we're doing way better. Our, our web traffic is up 243% from a year over year. Our Instagram engagement and reach is up 259%. Um, Twitter reach is up 313% from a year ago. Um, so this has been one hell of a year. We have, you know, added new revenue streams, um, text marketing and other, you know, like we just started using text instead of email. Um, like it's been a, it's been a heck of a year for us. Um, that's amazing. And yeah. Still got the passion. Still got the passion. No, I know. I love that. Um, now, in terms of that, that business, how do you, you know, as more and more gets outsourced to employees and people um, who are doing some of those, you know, you said when you're starting, like everybody's the janitor, CFO, CEO, et cetera. Um, yep. But when you're no longer those things, um, how do you stay uh, sort of excited about that business as it's, you know, you're still in charge, but it's like, if you're not doing a lot of the individual tasks, how do you, how do you get yourself to stay super excited about those things and not just move on to the next? So what, it, part of the reason I think we've had a lot of great success this year is because I took my hands off of so many things. I let everybody else do what they do best and let them focus on that. Before I was micromanaging, I had, I wanted to know end to end everything that was being done. And you know, like when you, you, there is such thing as loving your business too much or being too ingrained in it. And I, you know, am more hands off on the day to day with a lot of different tasks. But what that does is that it gives me the time to look from 30,000 feet up at focus more on like the purpose and the, and the overall whys of the business than the what's in house. And trust me, that's much more enjoyable. You know, like, yeah, I still have to oversee back office stuff, but like when you can spend your time on, on what you, where you would like to see the company go rather than making sure the thing is running. I mean, I, I'm way more in, in, in like motivated by the former, you know, that to me is much more exciting. Those broad breaststrokes are so much better than the little ones. It's, you know, they, yeah. always, say, they always say like, the, for a guy like Jeff Bezos, his job every day 
is to make like two or three good decisions. If he makes two or three good decisions, it is an incredible day. So he takes all day, 12 hours to say yes or no to like three different things. And that is I mean, game changing. This year I made, I would say if you, if I had four decisions, I probably four or five decisions this year is this the difference between a flat year and where we are. There were four or five decisions I made over the course of this year. And that's all it is. Making and that's it, all it takes. But, but that's the, all. Right, the right decisions. It's the right ones. Yeah, it's, it's the right ones. I mean, just like, I don't know, when I was 17 years old, I made the decision that I no longer wanted to sell on eBay and instead build a website and build a name. That was one decision I made. That was, hey, mom, can I give you eight bucks so I can use your credit card and buy this domain? That was one decision. That decision changed my life. You know, there was one decision even before that where I was like, I want to go get a job because I don't want to just hang out at, at, at home after school. That one decision was go get a job at Athletes World. And I haven't left the footwear business since. I love that. That's it. Everybody's got to make that one decision. Um, so what, yep. what, are you, what are you looking forward to now? What are you most excited about doing in 2021, whether it be personal, fitness, business, whatever? Yeah. So on the, on the business side of things, like we, we had this project, oh my gosh, it, it, we started on it. It was started with a conversation in March of 2020, um, where I called uh, my friend at, um, at Hibbit Sports. Uh, out, and he's, a, he's from a small town here in Texas, uh, just like where I've been living. And I wanted to talk with him about this idea I had for a show or for a video series called Small Town Sneakerhead. And uh, if you know anything about me, I freaking love alliteration. So Small Town Sneakerhead was right up my alley with this one. Um, but the idea was instead of showing like the big city and uh, with sneakers, let's go to where people are not expecting to find sneakerheads. Let's showcase sneakerheads from, you know, not LA, New York, you know, Chicago. Let's go to Cheyenne, Wyoming. Let's go to Huntsville, Alabama. Let's go to places where you are not expecting this. And sure enough, like he loved it. And, you know, we took it, he's like, let us let me loop in the VP of marketing. And we set up a meeting the next, like next week or whatever. And I was, we were going to fly down. I was going to fly down over to Birmingham um, to, you know, go have the full like formal meeting and the pandemic hit. And at first, like the meeting was still on, but then, like Hibbit actually closed before they closed their doors to meetings before the state of Alabama shut down because of the pandemic. We just got that video series live and it was, you know, uh, just at the end of the year in December. So I'm hoping, you know, next year looking to do more with that, not just that series, but other video series. Um, and there are ones where the show like really showing that people can be in the shoes that you wouldn't necessarily predict and showing a different side of people who are involved in footwear, um, but more on the people side of things than the product side of it. So that's something that I'm really excited for in 2021. Whoops, my bad. Um, I love that. Where can people find you best if they want to follow you on social media? My uh, best place is on Instagram, at Matt Halfhill. Um, and better be following at nice kicks because that's that's going to keep you in the loop amazing well matt thank you so much again i'm excited to see all your continued uh success on on the health fitness and uh business front and it's it's been a pleasure connecting with you these last couple months no doubt thank you so much awesome all right everybody see you on the next one peace awesome